How you like that? That'll wake you up. Welcome this morning again to our Breezeway Bible Fellowship Bible Study. We are here. As I was studying, when once I get off my, once I am removed from my expository first by first chapter preaching, and I've always done this, you, not, not always done this, when I come back from a fellowship meeting or a conference, I'm always wanting to share with you what I have been learning. And as a result of that, I have to look at other things, and this morning I was going to continue... Charity, on your notes from last week, could you tell me how, what I did? I think I, I did two things. I, I, I used Steve Lawson's notes from the Shepherds Conference, and I'm thinking about using Phil Johnson's uh, notes from the Shepherds Conference. I love Phil Johnson as well. He is the he is on Grace to You, and he introduces the service by John MacArthur. As a result of all that, I went through my material that I had. I have some two hundred three ring binders of material that I have I, either I have printed or. I have, or I have downloaded material from that. Someone said recently, 50 years ago, Cecil Nunnekamp, I believe, said that I had enough information in my head to preach a month. And that is true. I have to reframe myself to stay within the framework that I'm doing. So I've got, I came across, just came across this morning, some the pilgrim at gracegym.org pilgrim at gracegyms.org I think that's very essential I, they, 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 and the, this one was on let me very let me say first of all too I have to preach I have to teach or I read or I hear through other means, media, above my current level of Christian or piety living. I'm down here. I'm always wanting to learn something where I can be up here. <coughs> I've never wanted to be satisfied living the domain. I'm 75 years old. And I hope that over those years that I have grown great, greater in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not want to be stable. I do not want to get in a pond of water and get it stale and just stay there. This lesson, briefly, before I go maybe to the other one. Intimate piety. Imminent. Imminent piety. Starts with an E. Not an I. Intimate in one sense. How you pronounce it again, dear? Imminent. Imminent. <laughs> Imminent. M and M's. <laughs> I got to say. I got to say M I N E N T. Piety. Now, Pilgrim at GraceGems.org is not written by modern. Preachers. It is written by those in the 1500, 1600, 1700 
men who had a rich understanding of Scripture. Intima intimacy in piety. Intimacy in piety signifies our having all the parts of the Christian character in considerable strengths and in attractive proportions. Let me say that again. Here is a real piety Christian. It signifies our having all the parts of the Christian character in considerable strength and in attractive proportions. I love to see three or four people on Facebook that illustrates in their personal life what really is coming from their heart. In considerable strength and attractive proportions and in attractive proportion. That is a Christian. It implies even greater prominence for outstanding quality or character. In other words, if you see a person who claims to be a Christian, there is a prominence in him or her, an outstanding quality or character. And now, and now I looked up these words. Distinguished. Distinguish is another synonym for this word. Implies acknowledged excellence or superiority in the spiritual sense. There is a quietness about that person. Piety stresses fidelity to obligations regarded as natural and fundamental. Piety st stresses a fidelity to obligations regarded as natural and fundamental. In other words, one is bound by our soul in living our Christian character. Did I get that you understand any of that? You didn't understand any of that? I got the distinguished means implied excellence or superiority in character, but then I got lost. With piety. piety. So definition for piety. Mm -hmm. Stresses fidelity. F-I-D-E-L-I-T-Y. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. To obligations regarded as natural. It is natural to this Christian. It is fundamentally to his life. And they are bound by this fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me give you 22, quickly, 22 statements that says this. Intimate, intimate piety, zeal, or loyalty, another word I could use, synonym. Your loyalty and your zeal to your superiority in your living is always accomplished by, and I'll go down this list, a large measure of spiritual affections. A large measure of spiritual affections. You're constantly, by the way, you don't have to. The Holy Spirit does it. The Holy Spirit intervenes. This is under number one. The Holy Spirit always gives you a measure of spiritual affections. There is this desire in your spirit to give a spiritual account to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, a struggle for universal holiness. A struggle for universal holiness. 
there is a desire to be as holy as you can. A Christian should never say, but we do often say, I can't be as holy as I would like to be. Maybe we should say that I, I desire to be holy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than saying, it is impossible for me and myself to be holy in any area of my life. In other words, that's a negative comment. It may be true. But our desire in our heart, in our soul, and in our spirit to come more like the character of Christ. We can never be like Christ in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God. And in God, he was perfect. In everything that Jesus Christ done on earth was perfect. And obviously, we as believers today can never be perfect. We spend more time asking God to forgive us because we, we have a desire to live above our pay grade. Next, a desire and endeavor for purity of heart. A desire and endeavor for purity of heart. Our heart is who we are. When I see myself in the light of Scripture and in light of my spirit, I want to have an endeavor for purity of my heart. I realize that in the human flesh that's not possible. But we desire that. Thirdly, or fourthly, a prevailing taste for divine and heavenly things. A prevailing taste for divine and heavenly things. As I've said before, most people assume that a preacher has all of these. I put my shoes on like anyone else. Well, not like Bill, but otherwise I... <laughs> I have to put my shoes on one shoe at a time. <laughs> he wears different shoes than I do. But we all wear different shoes. We all live in a different shoe life. But our desire is to have a taste for divine and heavenly things. Now, it's okay to have desires for other things. But the prevailing thought is, next, a walking with God. There is a desire to walk along the side of God. Anytime we have friends or relatives to come to our house, Charity works herself to death. I must say, though, that she works that way all the time. But she puts in a little more effort when folks are coming by. If you walked alongside God today, if you were able to put your arms, or God put his arms around you, what would that do to your spirit? How would you react, and how would you think? How would you confess your sin? How would you confess how little we have done for Christ in that sense? Next, a living by faith. A living by faith. There is no other way to live the Christian life other than by faith. Faith is a gift from God. Our own faith, no. But we were saved by God's grace. We were saved by God's faith. And we have within us a faith that enables us to live by faith. Next, a setting of affections on things above. A setting of affection, our affections on things above. It 
it's okay to have interest. It's okay to enjoy. But above all of that <coughs> is our affections and our desire is on things above. From above. Heaven. Next, being dead to the world. Being dead to the world. We all face the world every day. God chose not to take us who are still living out of this world. If we are still living in this world today, and if we are a Christian, we have a purpose. As a matter of fact, God has given purpose to everyone. The purpose is that God gives lost people is that they do things to help the Christian. Most, event, most invent, inventions, inventions has been done by lost people. Everything that we have that enhances our life has been done by lost people. But the giftedness and the ability to do that has come by people who are not Christians. God wants us to have a life that's going to benefit Him. Next, a mortification of sin in the heart. A mortification. Who was it? John Owens that wrote the, motiv uh, the mortification. Then it putting to death. Putting to death sin. If we are a believer... God puts into our spirit that which is sin and is not glorifying to God. And therefore we need to put to death those sins that are taking us away from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, a proneness to devout meditation. A proneness to devout medica medication. <laughs> meditation. We are prone to take all of our medication when necessary. We love to take strict medication that's going to help us physically. It's okay. We should. But to have a prominence, prominence, to devout meditation. We are prone to want to meditate. I'm already confessing my above my pay level. I've already got halfway through these and I think perhaps that I could uh, improve in all of them. Next, a delight to hold communion with God. A delight to hold communion with God. There is a delight in our spirit to have a conversation with God. I mean, it just pops in your head. It becomes a regular concept in your heart and your mind that God pops up in your heart and your mind. And then next, a fondness for the scriptures. A fondness for the scriptures. Even as I get older in ministry, and even though I've read the Bible often on my desk that Terry allows me to have in the sunroom, I have three, I have six Bibles laid out and there's there, there's six different helps in studying the Bible and helping me know what the scripture is teaching and I began again going through each book of the Bible 
And at, at the beginning of that book, there is a couple pages on helping us understand what is in the book. The reason why many people will say, I don't understand the Bible. I would, I, if I could understand the Bible, I'd read it. Well, that's your fault. Because you can't understand the Bible. And this, and, and when I'm reading this, reading these introductions, I'm saying to myself, why didn't I learn that 30 years ago? Why do I have to wait till I'm 75? And I wrote down some notes. I took Pentateuch in seminary under Dr. J, under Dr. Oldham, and I had to, I supposed to have read the first five books of the Bible three times. Three times. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I would venture to say, I wonder how many people even read Genesis. Shame on you. But to read it in seminary three times in a semester, working 40 hours a week, is extremely hard to do that. You can find time to study the Word of God. There is, a, there is a desire to, like I'm saying, you say, well, I'm a preacher. It's just as easy for us to neglect the Scripture as it is anyone else, just about less what you're texting. All right, I don't preach on that anymore. A large portion of love to the brethren. A large <laughs> portion of love to the brethren. When was the last time you sat down with a brother in Christ outside of church and had a conversation? I was in a large church a couple months ago, and I sat beside, I sat behind a, a man and his son, and the preacher had a tremendous sermon. But as soon as the bell rang, and he dismissed the church. He sat on the second row from the back, and immediately they got up and rushed out of the church without any communication at all. I'm not sure why they even went to church. I've been in churches where I actually had to step in front of people to say hello. <laughs> they have no real fellowship with other Christians. If you're never around Christians, you're going to begin to act just like they do. You cannot afford not to have some Christian fellowship. Next, an inflexible integrity. What in the world? An inflexible integrity. <coughs> I'm thinking of my wife on that deal. I like to flex a little bit, but to have an inflexibility on integrity is important. Next, a liberality, a liberality for the cause of Christ. In other words, you feel not restrained <coughs> by your giving of yourself to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Number next, an at, 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 uh, alertness, A-R-D-E-N-T. <clears throat> what? A-R-D, A-R-D-N-E-T. <clears throat> A-R-D-E-N-T. What's that? Ardent. Huh? Ardent. Ardent. Love for biblical ordinance. When's the last time you read the church bylaws or the statement of faith? Do you know what I believe? Can you say what I believe about justification, sanctification, glorification? Can you explain to someone what my love what my position is on salvation. 
The ordinance is what we, ha we do. Number next is an enjoyment of peace that passes understanding. An enjoyment of peace that passes understanding. I used to say, I don't think that, I, I don't know. I don't know why I enjoy the Christian life so much. I don't understand why whatever's going on in my life, there's a peace that surpasses my understanding of why do I have such peace in my heart and life. Now, the next one, a frequent experience of spiritual joy. A frequent experience of spiritual joy. In recent weeks, there's been this Asbury. It happens every 10 years. These kids, more than likely, will go back to their routine that they had. There, doesn't, there may not be a continuation, but it just happens. They call it a revival. They call it that God, in a special moment, a special time, in a special place, decides to come down and fill every Christian with the Holy Spirit in a special way. It should be every day. It should be every day that we as a Christian have an experience of spiritual joy. Next. Oh, I could preach a sermon on all these. An exquisite tenderness of conscience. A E X Q U I S I T E. Did you get that, dear? Uh -huh. Tenderness of conscience. Your conscience was placed there by God. Some people don't even have, everybody has a conscience. God builds into every person a conscience. That's where God dwells. The conscience is outside of yourself. Your conscience is what God puts in there that you can't get rid of unless you, unless you continue to ignore it. I'm glad God gives us a conscience. How many times a day that your conscience affects you, right or wrong? If you're in your car and you're doing 80 miles an hour, and you're a Christian. <laughs> if you say something bad about a preacher, and you're a Christian, if you have a tenderness of conscience, it's going to affect you. I really would like and I have done that. I want to be conscious of God's presence. I have never said to God, God, would you mind waiting outside while I go inside? I want God to be right beside me. I want to hear your voice giving me instructions. That is my desire. I want a God consciousness, a scriptural consciousness, and I want this Bible lesson to be a part of your consciousness. Next, a mind which trembles at sin. A mind which trembles at sin. Sin is... That which does not bring glory to God. Sin is that which draws you away from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin is the element in every person's life 
that we have to constantly be aware of. Well, Dad, is that a sin? You mean to tell me that that is anything that we're not conscious of? We need to be very conscious of it. Next, a constant frame for our many imperfections. We need to consistently be in the framework for our many imperfections. A constant. A constant, I, I left out the word, P-E-N I-T-E-N-T-I-A-L What's it say there? Penitential. Like yes. to repent or to yes. be penitent right. for sin. In other words, rather than to say, oh well, I'm human. You don't know the troubles that I know. You just don't know how weak I am in my Christian life and my understanding of Scripture and my walk with God. I mean, it's a wonder I'm even a Christian. I'm sure I'm a weak Christian. That's no excuse. Our desire is to be way above our lifestyle. I want to go out fresh. I want to be able to have in my spirit the love of Christ. Next, a holy watchfulness against sins. A holy watchfulness against sins of my life. I'm not sure I want to write all those down that God brings to my consciousness. A holy watchfulness against sins of my tongue. Oh my goodness. The sins of my tongue. And that goes when no one else is around. I dare not say something in public how I hate, or how I despise, or how I dislike, but boy, when I'm by myself or my wife, sometimes my tongue can say some things that I have to repent of. A holy watchfulness against sins of my life, of my tongue, of my imagination, of my imagination. We need to be extremely careful of going beyond our ability, our, our thinking, our imagination. Only if I imagine, I only imagine, if I could have done this, if I could have done that, or if I could be this. Listen, we are who we are by the grace of God. Even in spite of of all our life, it is part of the plan of God in our life. Not only holy watchfulness against sins of our life, of our tongue, of our imagination, and of the heart. The sins of our heart. That is what really is. You know. But see, here is the point. The more you know about God, the more you know about Jesus Christ. And you allow it to come into your life and your heart, and you are settled in your heart. What, you know, you can, you can just listen and let it fly in one ear and out the other ear. A lot of times I'm listening to something and I have no clue what they just said. I watch television a lot of times and it comes in and out of my ears. I'm not penetrating on all the consciousness that's going on. 
piety, the word piety, is not an abstract system of doctrine and ethics. Piety, it is a constant movement. It is a constant movement of the heart to the splendor and attraction of the cross of Christ. Piety is not an abstract system of doctrine and ethics. It is a constant movement of the heart to the splendor and attraction of the cross of Christ. There is an attraction in our heart for the cross of Christ. We take up the cross and live. It is a devotion. Piety is a faithfulness to Christ. It is one who is bound by our soul. This attraction of the cross of Christ is bound in our soul to become like Christ. May men see something of God in me. May others see in me Christ. When I die, I would hope that they would say, more, well, he loved trains, or he loved Hot Wheels, or he loved sports cards. I want someone to say he had a genuine love for Jesus Christ in his living. John 13, 15. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. John 13, 15. It has long been my conviction that there is a great deficiency in evangelical churches of the practical, practical enforcement of Christian duties in detail, especially of what may be called Christian virtues. I used to spend a lot of time on secular wearing a dress, wearing a tie, having a, your hair long. Those are outward signs that never even should be talked about. I spent a lot of time in my mind saying, I don't want to listen to that preacher who doesn't have a tie on. He looks like he's, he came out, he came from the world. I've always thought, how can you go to church looking like you've gone to a theater? The passive grace, the passive graces of the Christian character. The passive graces of the Christian character. The exercise of brotherly kindness and love. It is not so acceptable to have all the special and difficult duties of the Christian life, our man's conduct to his followers, fellows, set clearly before the understanding and enforced upon the conscience. <coughs> <coughs> Men do not like to follow through all of the complexity of the heart's the de deficiencies, deceitfulness, beaten out of every refuge of lies, and made to feel the obligation to love where they are inclined to hate, and to forgive where they desire to revenge. If you watch, you, know, you can watch most movies, especially westerns, the central theme is revenge. That is so wrong. They want to revenge their parents' killing. They want to revenge their family's killing. 
they out to find the five men that did this. It's all about revenge. And we bought into that. And we ministers ponder too much to this taste. The pulpit has not done its duty. We have preached to the intellect, to the imagination, and to the taste, but not enough to the heart and to the consciousness. I heard John MacArthur say, I'm not trying to reach your mind, I'm trying to reach your heart. In our endeavor to please, we have not been sufficiently intent upon the greater object to profit. We have not preached justification too much, but sanctification too little. We have urged faith, but not love. We have decanted upon the evil of licentiousness and falsehood and dishonesty and covetousness, but have said far, far too little about malice and bitterness. We have urged man to zeal and liberality, but not enough to humility and forbearance and forgiveness. We have rightly led men to view the cross of Christ, but we have not sufficiently urged them to take up their own cross. We have properly entreated them to view Jesus as the righteousness, but not sufficiently for their example. My example in my life is not John Wayne, but Jesus Christ. The example that I'm trying to follow, well, he's, hey, what does people say most about you? He's trying to imitate Michael Jordan. He's trying to imitate, but a lost person should say he is trying to imitate Jesus Christ. His life is so filled with the love of Jesus Christ that he can't keep talking about it. I'm amazed how little we talk about Jesus. I've always complained about that, haven't I? We have a fellowship, and we can spend hours together and never once mention Jesus Christ. We don't want to stir up any problems. Let me, let me address an issue about your salvation. Let me address what it means to be a piety in your Christian, be piety in your Christian life. Let's have a let's have a conversation about where is your life leading you to? What are your friends saying about you? Do they see Christ in you? Oh Christians, study that wondrous character. Christ. Contemplate that pattern. Dwell upon that beautiful model until the frosty of your cold heart has melted like icicles before the sun. How wonderful and how ennobling is the concept and what an ambition should it raise in the mind of a Christian to consider and say, men may set something of God in me. Men may see something of God in me. Well, I don't want them to see too much. I don't want them to think I'm too heavenly good to be any earthly good. I've yet to meet anybody that was so so heavily minded that they were no earthly good. Yes, we can teach them what God is as to his moral character and let them see in our merciful disposition a ray of infinite sun of his own glory. These sweet renderings of our nature, these soft and the gentle cotton carrot of our soul. These infusions of love, these we can remind them 
are but the overflowing of His goodness, His own love, into our heart and the reflection of His infinite mercy to us. 1 John 2.6 says this, The one who says he abides in Him should walk just as He walked. 1 John 2.6 and then in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. Father, we do give you thanks this morning for these thoughts that have been laid before us. May we ponder these thoughts at least for a minute. May we not switch our mind to something entirely different and push out what we have heard. Many will listen with a thimble to be filled, and then they'll walk out and trip and spill any spiritual understanding that they've had from this sermon. But I pray, Lord, that you give us a cup full. May it run over with your love and your kindness and your mercy that you give us through Christ. May you pour within us the constant love that you have for us and may you be our example to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It's cold now. Ooh. You want me to dump it? <laughs>